again, give us uh, an upfront um, notification that this sermon is for mature audiences. And so I want to, parents, give you an opportunity. If you're at home and you have uh, young kids, uh, preferably those who are in elementary school or younger, um, obviously uh, we want to give you the opportunity to let them go and watch TV or do something else, um, give them headphones or whatever you need to do. Uh, but this content is for mature audiences. And so I want to encourage you, if you have children um, who are in elementary school, uh, to go ahead and uh, get them busy doing something else. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we want to be able to talk freely today, uh, see what God has to say to us in the Word. And so we want to be able to be sensitive to that. We don't want to necessarily share anything um, out of God's Word uh, that you don't necessarily want your child to hear just yet. Amen. Make love, not war. Peace, love, and happiness. Those were a couple of major taglines of the hippies movement in the 1960s. I don't know if any, I'm sure there were some people in the room who were born in the 1960s. That was beyond my time, before my time. But uh, anyway, uh, that was, those were some of the taglines that characterized the hippies movement. These hippies, these flower children were not just about self-expression and sporting flared pants or what we call bell bottoms. They were not just about sporting psychedelic colors and peace signs and sporting long hair and beards. Though they didn't necessarily see themselves as political activists, they did oppose the Vietnam War. They opposed government authority and they opposed middle class values at that day and of that day. They organized themselves and they put on nonviolent anti-war protests and marches. And they had uh, the biggest, before there was a uh, fire festival, which was a A flop. Before any of the other big festival, music festivals that you know, South by Southwest, there was the Woodstock Music Festival, drawing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. They would gather together and listen uh, to music, and other things would take place during the festival. But there was another slogan, Chris, that characterized uh, this hippie movement. And it went like this. If it feels good, do it. This philosophy or way of thinking not only manifested itself in rampant drug usage, it also showed up, hear this, in their embrace and promotion of sexual liberation. They called it free love. Free love meaning strictly and quite frankly having sex. That's what they meant by free love. And they were so bought into this idea of free love that they would say things like somebody even, even quipped about that time in history that free love meant that you could have sex with anyone, anytime, anywhere, without guilt or shame. So it was not uncommon for you to attend the Woodstock Festival and you had people that were literally engaging in sex on the festival grounds in front of everybody. Well, before there was 20th century San Francisco and other cities in the United States, there was first century Corinth <laughs> with a temple dedicated to Aphrodite 
Aphrodite was the patron goddess of love, beauty, desire, and all things sexual, along with brothels. It was their version of the red light district that was scattered about with prostitutes and sex slaves ready to service their clientele. Corinth had a culture of sexual freedom where, for the most part, they felt that anything goes. The sexual vices in Corinth ran the gamut from one extreme homosexual practices to self-pleasure. I told you this is sermon for mature audiences. There was a philosopher that even confirmed this. He told a crowd once that he himself met the goddess Aphrodite everywhere and at no expense. When asked what he meant by that, he lifted up his tunic and pretended to masturbate. What seemed to drive this sexual wildness were two ideologies that Paul picked up on and where he, what he addresses here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here is the first ideology. It's right there. I want you to see it in verse 12. Paul says this first ideology that was rampant in the culture of Corinth is that everything is permissible. Everything is allowable. Everything is lawful. There was this sense, this belief in the larger society that, again, anything goes. That might be the mindset of the culture and what the culture encourages uh, me to embrace. But Paul says, watch what he says, but for, for me, everything is not helpful. Everything is not beneficial. Not all things, Paul says, to him or to others, for that matter, um, were advantageous. Notice that Paul doesn't go into specifics here about what he means about all things being permissible, but everything is not beneficial. So I won't hang out there long in this particular verse. But life tends to bear out the truth of what Paul said here in relationship to sexual sin. Think about it with me. Sexual sin is not beneficial or profitable For example, to our relationship with God. Sexual sin will cause us to have a lack of assurance of salvation. Sexual sin, in some cases, will also, on God's um, account and according to his discretion, can cause us to incur his discipline. This is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, which we will get there later, where Paul says that the Israelites were committing, some of them were committing sexual immorality and God disciplined them. He judged them. So sexual sin is not only not beneficial to our relationship with God, but sexual sin is also not beneficial to our relationship with other people. (laughs) Uh. If any of you have been involved in sexual sin, you you know that it can wreak havoc on your relationships with other people. It creates shallow and dysfunctional relationships. You know, some of y'all know this. You don't have to raise your hand or, you know, put a thumbs up in the chat. But think about it with me. In some cases, it clouds our judgment. You have sex with a particular individual, and and, and people see things about this individual, but you find it hard to believe it, and the reason you find it hard to believe is because you don't see nothing wrong with a little, yeah. Let's be honest. When we commit sexual sin, 
We, we, we have the tendency uh, to see sex and how good that person is in bed more than we have a tendency to see the condition of their soul. <laughs> Sexual sin will have you dismissing things about a person you should be paying way more attention to. I know she, I know she real clingy, but that don't bother me much. The reason why you, it don't bother you much is because sex is kind of at the center of your dating relationship. And you don't realize that you got an Annie Wilkes from misery on your hands. <laughs> You're going to end up tied up to a bed with a two by four on your ankles and she's going to be sledgehammering, your, breaking your ankles apart. But you, don't, you ain't even concerned about that. You in the house, you walk right past the sledgehammer, walk right past the two by four. Or the four by four, all because you headed to that bed. She talking about it's just for decoration. No, that's that's for you later on. <laughs> I know, I know he got serious anger issues, but that's just how men are. So you dismiss it, not knowing that this brother has a tendency to lose his temper and to be violent. But you, you know, you don't, you don't mind that because, because you're involved in sexual sin with him. I mean, I know she is a jealous type, but that's really Tracy, just because she's just a ride or die chick. No, no, no. You, you just can't see it. Because your judgment is cloudy because sex is clouding your vision. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. You used to have, you, you, had, you, you had better discernment than that. But, but, but sex has a way of dulling and nulling your discernment. Mm. I know he is a bit controlling, but that's just because he loved me. No, it's, you just can't see it. Or you refuse to see it because he, he knows how he knows he knows how to please you. Yeah. Yeah. But sexual sin is not only not beneficial to our relationship with God, not only is it not beneficial to our relationship with others, it is also not beneficial to in relationship to our own lives. Yeah. Some of us know this, and thank God he is a redeemer, and thank God he forgives, yeah. and thank God he restores. But there have been occasions where God has allowed some of us, our consequences, to catch up with us. Yeah. We've committed sexual sin, and there was deferred dreams. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That we, we, could, we were involved in sexually uh, immorality, and, and it, it denied some dreams. Maybe there was an unplanned pregnancy, and things happened. Well, you were going to go to that college, but no more. At least not at this moment in your life. And yes, thank God he is gracious. And thank God he is, he, he is, is he's a restorer. And, and you went to college later on. But, but, but there could have been some things that could have been prevented. You, you could have gotten that done and over with. Yeah. Thank God we don't have to necessarily live in regret. But listen, we need, to, we need to encourage our young people to say, listen, listen, this thing is not beneficial to you. Yeah. Not only that. For some of us, we contracted STDs. Mm. And we don't tell nobody. You ain't got to say nothing. But you know what happened. Ooh, it went quiet right there. Just, I mean, you can. Like my dad used to say, y'all, he was from Bunky, so don't, don't get offensive. He said, you can hear a rat peeing on cotton right there. You can hear a rat peeing on cotton. Not only... Jackie, are all things not beneficial or helpful? Paul said, also said in relationship to this idea that all things are lawful and permissible. He also said to that idea that all things are lawful and permissible. Watch, watch what he says. Still in verse 12. But I will not be brought under the control of anything. He said, I will not be dominated by anything. Suffice it to say, again, not going to hang out too much here because Paul doesn't go into any detail, but he suffice it to say, sexual sin tends to degenerate into bondage or addiction. Mm. Sexual sin 
doesn't simply want to partner with you in the fulfillment of your sexual desires. It desires to make you its slave. And with sexual sin as your master, there is no telling what depths of depravity, deception, destruction, dysfunction, de depression, and dissatisfaction it will take you to. Oh, come on, y'all. Faint. When you, from, for those of y'all that were, uh, are watching online or in the building, when you, when you, this was your struggle. And when you were involved in sexual immorality and you were really involved in that thing, it led you to some dark places spiritually. Yeah. Depressed. Yeah. Destroyed some things in your life. Dissatisfied. You, you had this aching thing in your heart. Things just never were right yeah. Yeah. in your life. Here's the second ideology. Let me, let me hurry. Here's the second ideology. The first ideology, Paul says right there in verse 12, everything is permissible. But here's the second ideology that drove sexual wildness in, the, in Corinth. Verse 13. Food is for the stomach and the stomach for food. And, and God, excuse me, will destroy or abolish both one and the other. Now, in your translation, if you have this particular translation, some translations place quotations around food is for the stomach and close the quotation at the stomach is for food. But I believe the New English translation is right in extending it to include the last phrase. For, God, for food is, is for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy and abolish both one and the other. See, the Corinthians saw sex and the body as they did food and the stomach. They saw both of those things, sex in the body, food and stomach, as natural and necessary parts of life that did not take away from its quality, but rather added to it. To deny yourself, they would, Corinthian culture would believe, to deny yourself of sexual gratification was in actuality, they would say, a detriment to your life. It's damaging, it's unhealthy, they would say, for you to suppress Sexual gratification. Doesn't that sound familiar? That don't just sound like Corinthian culture. That sounds like American culture. And they would add to that, watch this, and because God will destroy both anyway, meaning that God will bring both of them to an end in death, there is nothing beyond death that involves our physical bodies because that's what some believe, and even some in the church believe that because they didn't believe that there was a bodily resurrection that we'll talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that they didn't believe that there was a, some people didn't believe, even Christians, some Christians didn't believe that there was a bodily resurrection. So if, if, if this life is all that there is and God's going to bring this thing to an end anyway, they would say then there is no real eternal consequence to sexual sin. So have at it. Because there is no consequence to sin. There is no afterlife in terms of physical existence. Yet they would say your soul is what is going to heaven, not your body. So, so have at it. Isn't it sadly amazing? The lengths we will go to to twist and exploit theology to justify our sin. Y'all need to let that marinate. Yeah, truly. You're right. But God will destroy this both in the end. So what's the what's the, what's the big old, what's the big deal? Twisting theology to suit our own passions. Don't know if that happens today. I'm joking, it does. Unfortunately, it does where we're willing to twist and bend scripture to fit our own sinful yeah. desires. Right. Thanks be to God that God loves us too much mm. to not direct or train us in righteousness. He loves us too much to not teach us how to live like Christ in this area. And so God the Spirit led Paul to put pen to parchment to instruct not only the Christians then in ancient Corinth, but to instruct us as Christians now in modern day context. Paul says, I know you are living in societies that pride themselves in having sexual freedom. 
I know you are living in a highly sexualized world. And I know many of you are constantly being bombarded with the sexual temptations that arise from your own sinful flesh. All of this shouts to you and to me on a daily basis, if it feels good, do it. But God's take on this matter is what matters. The main takeaway that God wants you and I to hear and apply to our lives is based on the two commands given to us in this passage by Paul. Two commands. I want to show you the first command is right there. I'm going to find it. Give me a second. Verse 18. Flee. Second command is in verse 20. Glorify. So here's, here's the big idea of this sermon, Harvest Fellowship online and friends and in the building. Here's the main point. Paul says, glorify God with your body by being sexual immorality. Glorify God with your body by fleeing sexual immorality. That's the main point. That's the big takeaway. And just to be clear, sexual immorality is an umbrella term here. It's an umbrella term, meaning it refers to all kinds of unlawful, that is, God-opposed, sinful sexual acts. The list I am about to share with you in just a few seconds is not meant to be crude, but to give clarity to us on what God is talking about here through the Apostle Paul when he says, flee sexual immorality. Y'all ready? Consensual sex before marriage is sexual immorality. Tune in. Don't, don't, you, don't you log off. Stay right here. Don't y'all, don't turn it. Come on. Stay right here. Because we need to hear God's word on the matter because the culture is telling us um, that they have a competing uh, uh, base, that they are, they are promoting and a platform that they are promoting things that are anti-God. Yeah. So we need to be clear. Truth is truth. Hear me. I need to say this to somebody, regardless of what your experience is. Yeah. Or what your past experience was. And watch this. This is not about condemning you because some of you all want to turn off and you may be feeling a sense of um, a lingering shame over repentant sin. This is, not, this is not what this is. This is not to condemn you in that way. This is not to shame you. And, and when you have repented of this and God has forgiven you of these type of sins, but we still have to set the standard as God's truth. We don't change God's truth just because... Our experience may have been different than that or have been um, engaged in sexual sin in our past. So consensual sex before marriage, what what the old church used to call fornication, premarital sex is sinful. Sex outside of your marriage, adultery, is sinful. You can call it an entanglement. You can call it whatever you want, but sex outside of your marriage, if you are married or when you do get married, is sinful. Molestation is sinful. Child molestation is sinful. Rape is sinful. Indecent exposure is sinful. This, this hits me because this was in my past right here. Not indecent exposure. Not that piece. <laughs> Watch out. Hold it now. Wait a minute. I ain't going to put all my business out there. Wait a minute. I never did that. But um, now, now, and I'm not saying that's not to, not to puff me up because this is where I, sexual dancing. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't look at me like that because in my, come on, y'all. In my, in my generation, Bumping and grinding, gyrating, grooving up on freaking is what some people called it. 
Come on, it's mature. Don't y'all look at me like, don't you look at me like, you know exactly what I was talking about. Yeah, all that. <laughs> all of that. It's, it's sinful. I mean, come on, y'all, think with me. I'm not trying to camp out here too long, but think with me. It, it, it produces and induces lust in the heart. It is, it is sex on the dance floor. That's why they called it in, in the older generation, dirty dancing. Say what you want. If you accept the truth. Here it is. Here's another one. Self-pleasure while watching pornography. Sexting. Homosexuality. Lesbianism. Bisexual, bisexuality. Same-sex relationships and same-sex marriages. Sinful. Sinful. Listen, listen that we, can, we can still love people, but it doesn't change the truth of God's word. It's sinful. And by the way, people will tell you that, well, there was, this was a different thing going on in Corinth, right, right Chris? They'll try to, they'll try to, they'll try to uh, combat this. They'll try to say, well, this was just really about um, uh, older men who were, who were taking advantage of younger boys. No, 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 no. No, no, no. There, there, were, there, were, there were adult men and adult women who were doing these things. Prostitution. And this, this next one is connected to prostitution. I understand that some women um, are sex trafficked into that. All of that is sinful. Porn industry. Sinful. Do y'all know? Some of y'all know. Do you know? That sex trafficking oftentimes is the underground railroad into the porn industry. Brothers and sisters, this is one of the reasons why we, are, we, we call you, as, if, for, for a Christian brother and a Christian sister, why we call you to repent of watching that pornography. Not only is it a sin against God, but you're funding, you're, you're, you're supporting inadvertently, indirectly, the sex trafficking black market. Because oftentimes there are women who've been put into that porn industry who have been taken, been kidnapped, and they are forced into that industry. They are sex slaves. Strip club dancing. Rat ran across the... And he, he over there doing number one on cotton, right? Right there. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Let's be... I, what? I don't, y'all grown. Come on. You think God going to endorse? You think he endorsed? You think he, you think he, he smiles? You think he gives a thumbs up? You think he gives hearts and emojis to that? No. No. That too oftentimes is, can be a funnel that, you know, that comes out of sex trafficking. Oral sex. You know, there was a part in my generation where, where there were Christians who were trying to justify or trying to say that it was, if, if, if they did oral sex, that it, really, it, wasn't, it wasn't fornication. That, that, that because we didn't do it the, the regular way, the normal way in terms of having sex, in terms of intercourse, that somehow that, that they can do oral and it'd be okay with God. No, it's sinful. And even to the extreme of bestiality, it's sinful. In verses 13b through 20, as we kind of move to the body of this sermon, I want to give you four major truths that help us understand why we should glorify God with our bodies by fleeing sexual immorality. And Paul wants to, you, that's, a, that's a good parent, right? A good parent not only tells your child what they should not do, but, but explains and gives them reasons for why they should not do it. I want you to see these. Number one, our bodies are for the Lord, not for sexual immorality. Verse 13, Paul says, look what there, look there with me. But God will do away with them both. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. 
first major truth. Again, our bodies are for the Lord, not for sexual immorality. It's my body, though. I should be able to do what I please with my body. Anybody heard that before? Yeah. That is the world's mantra. Yeah. My body's my business. What I do with my body is up to me. That's none of your business, and that's none of God's business. As believers, our mantra is a biblical one which says different. Our mantra is, my body is under the lordship of Jesus, and I will do with it what pleases him. Notice, look at the verse with me. The body is not for sexual immorality, verse 13, but watch, this, watch Paul's terminology, but for the Lord. Yeah. Do you see? Our bodies as Christians comes under the lordship of Jesus, and we are told by Paul that therefore then we need to do with our bodies what pleases Jesus, yeah. not what pleases ourselves and not what pleases those around us, not what pleases your other single friends. Not with your other single friends or your other, other friends. Think about, you know, your life and what you should do. Our focus should be on making sure that we submit our bodies to the Lord. Your body and my body ought to be used for the Lord's purposes, not to perform sexual, sinful sexual acts. Number two, our bodies will be resurrected like Jesus one day. Verse 14, look there. God raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Brothers and sisters, our bodies, hear this, are not temporal. Our bodies are not temporal. They're not. Do our bodies decay and die due to original sin in terms of Adam? Yes, but our bodies are not temporal. That is to say that, that our bodies will be resurrected and will live forever. So our bodies are not simply shells that we discard at death and that frees our souls to be with Jesus forever in some unembodied um, kind of reality. No, to be human... Hear this, is to have both a soul and a body. Come on, come on, come on, Christians. Think, think with me. Go back in your mind to Genesis. God says he, he out of the dust, formed man. And he breathed into him a breath, the breath of life, and man became a living being. To be human is to be both soul and body. We are not just a soul that's trapped in a body that will one day discard this shell and then our souls will go to be with Jesus in this kind of you know, ephemeral whatever kind of existence that there is just a total bodiless state. No. We are embodied creations of God made in his image and our physical mortal bodies will be transformed into glorified, resurrected, immortal bodies in which we will live forever in the presence of God. So Paul is saying committing sexual immorality with our bodies in our present lives on earth is incompatible with our future reality and lives in eternity. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying, this is what's in store for you. You're going to be in a glorified, perfect body. This is what's true of you and what will be true of you in the future. So to live this kind of uh, in sexual sin in disregard of the body and doing things that Jesus doesn't want you to do is incompatible with how your life is going to be and my life is going to be in eternity. So we're going to be resurrected one day, just like Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And so what we will be in heaven, we need to live in concert with that while we're here on earth. Yeah. 
That if we're going to be in heaven and we're going to be embodied with glorified bodies and we're not going to be sinning and have sin in heaven and be um, away from the presence of sin, then Paul says we need to strive to live out that reality here on earth in the present. Here's the third point. We're almost through. Our bodies are members of Christ. Look at verse 15 with me and following. Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? So should I take a part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? You see, he's, Paul gets into specifics here because in the Corinthian context, this is what they were dealing with, were, were dealing with prostitutes, oftentimes temple prostitutes more than likely, but there were also other type of prostitutes in uh, Corinth. This was, a, this was a serious situation. This was a situational thing going on here, but it still applies to our context. Sexual acts, notice what Paul says. He says, should I... Verse 15, should I take part of Christ's body and make it a part of a prostitute? Absolutely not. Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says the two will become one flesh. Notice sexual acts involve a union. Mm -hmm. Having sex, hear this young person, hear this adult Christian, having sex is not casual. It is always serious. It is taking your body that belongs to Jesus and uniting it in the immoral act of sex with another person that has not been authorized by Jesus. Paul then refers back to Genesis 2, 24. To corroborate this, he says that then again, this sexual sin is it's a uniting factor to it. Not in terms of marriage, but the act of sex you, unites you in the very act. It unites you with that individual. As one commentator said, a believer belongs body, soul, and spirit only to the one Lord. And any unholy union with anyone else is a betrayal of our union with Christ. Notice what Paul says, verse 17, but anyone joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So he's saying to us as believers, you and I as believers, we are joined to the Lord spiritually. So when you, when I crawl into bed with somebody who is unauthorized by Jesus, when you and I are single and we step into sexual relationship in the bed with that person in, in a sense, we have taken our members that belong to Jesus, have taken it away from him and given it to that particular individual. The, the body that is supposed to be used for the Lord and his purposes, you have ripped that away from Jesus and have given that in an unholy union to somebody in that act of sexual immorality. So our spiritual union, hear this, brothers and sisters, our spiritual union with Jesus dictates our sexual union with others. So Jesus says then, if you are united with me spiritually and you're under my lordship, then I dictate who you have sex with. And I have dictated, hear this, it ain't that he's already dictated it. And here's what Jesus has dictated. The only sexual union that he endorses is the one that takes place within the context of a monogamous marriage with the opposite gender. Let me say it slower. Rewind it. The only sexual union that Jesus endorses is a monogamous marriage with the opposite gender. It's within that context that Jesus gives his thumbs up. Anything outside of that context, Jesus gives it a thumbs down. Your spiritual union with Jesus needs to take precedence over who you sexually unite with. 
And that is an indication that if, if you are sexually uniting with individuals outside of the marriage context, then that's, that says something about um, who is Lord of that area of your life. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying those of us who are, are, are stumbling forward in this. I'm talking about if you, if you sitting up in this mug, you know what I'm saying? Like, like you, 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 you just, you, you arms crossed. Let me take a seat in sexual immorality. And you're saying, I know what Jesus said. However, the Lord knows my heart. He gave me these sexual desires. He wouldn't want me to be frustrated and have pent up sexual frustration. So I'm just going to go ahead and do, I'm going to go ahead and relieve myself. And then I'll I ask for forgiveness later. After I'm done, then I'll say I'm sorry, but then, you know, tomorrow I'm, I'm going to answer the text and come over and we're just going to do it all over again. Do you, do you see the point? Yeah. Not saying that a person is not saved. I, I don't know what the condition of that or your salvation, but what it is saying is that at the very least, Jesus, you are not allowing him to lead you in that area of your life. Because if he's leading you, Jesus will always lead you into marriage. Yeah. Hear me, somebody. Yeah. Into marriage with another believer so that not only for this sole purpose, but as a benefit so that you can experience the joy of that sexual union and have his smile on you. Yeah. Right. Okay, I need to move. But, 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 you know, I think this is why people, why, why we shirk conviction. Why, why we shirk this is because we know God is frowning on. So, so we try to we try to do gymnast, gymnastics to 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 kind of get out of the way of of God's conviction that's that's coming to us. And so we'll do hermeneutical gymnastics. We'll interpret the Bible in a certain way and be like, well, you know, I mean, marriage is. I mean, it's just. I mean, if I'm married in my heart, what's what's the real what's the purpose? I mean, I am. What if I think I'm married? What what if? You know, but we ain't really actually married, but, you know, I mean, we've been together for so long, we might as well be married, and we, we, do, we, do, we do cartwheels and, you know, all that stuff to try to get around the fact that Jesus does not endorse this. So, John MacArthur, in his commentary on 1 Corinthians, says about Paul's statement in verse 18, where Paul says, every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. He says here about this verse that I believe he is saying, speaking of Paul, that although sexual sin is not necessarily the worst sin, it is the most unique in its character. It rises from within the body bent on personal gratification. It drives like no other impulse and when fulfilled affects the body like no other sin. It has a way of internally destroying a person that no other sin has. Because sexual intimacy is the deepest uniting of two persons, its misuse corrupts on the deepest human level. Fourth and finally, Paul says, the reason why you need to glorify God by fleeing sexual immorality is in verse 19. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body, my body, is the temple of God the Holy Spirit. So a Louisiana priest was arrested a couple of days ago for allegedly filming himself having sex with two women on the altar at a Catholic church. The altar the report says was adorned with stage lighting, several sex toys, and a cell phone mounted on a tripod that was recording the whole act. 
And the reason why they got found out is because a passerby saw the church, Catholic church lights on and peeped in and saw them engaging in sexual immorality and took their phone out and captured it. One of the two women, who happened to be also an adult film actress, had posted on her social media a day earlier that she was traveling to New Orleans to meet up with another dominatrix to defile a house of God. When we commit sexual immorality, we are doing what that woman did. But the difference is we're not defiling a building. We're defiling our body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Last part that Paul closes in this, he says in verse 20, you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Do you know, want to know the motivation for why, brother, sister, young, brother, young sister, why you and I need to flee and run from sexual immorality? is because Jesus has bought us out of the slave market of sin. He has redeemed us by his own precious blood. He paid a price, his life. He laid down for you and for me. He died on the cross for our sins, and those sins include sexual immorality. He died for that sin so that you and I can be forgiven by God, praise God, for the sexual immoral, immoral, immoral acts that we have committed. But also he died to free us from the power yeah. of sexual immoral sin. Yeah. You don't have to commit sexual immorality mm-hmm. because the Holy Spirit is in you and Jesus has freed you to be able to live sexually pure and to progress towards that and to repent of sexual sin if and when you commit it. Peter says, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways Inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So that's the call this this morning from Paul when it comes to sexual immorality. Single, married, dating, whatever the case is, Paul says to us as Christians, Glorify God with your body by fleeing from sexual immorality. Some of us have been, some of us have been walking, trying to walk away from sexual immorality. Looking back at it. (laughs) Some of us are standing there trying to say, I'm not going to touch it. Standing on the line in some cases. I'm not going to step across. I'm just looking. Paul says, "Mm -mm, that's not good enough. Sexual immorality is a beast. And you, you, you don't need to, you don't need to walk away from this. You don't need to tiptoe away from sexual immorality. You need to run from it. Because if you don't, it will catch up with you. And once it has you in its grip, the Lord Jesus can free you from it, but but it's a deceptive grip. It's one that, 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 that you'll just... That you don't need to be in, but, but you, the desire can get so strong yeah. that, it, that, it, that it outweighs your desire to do what it is that the Holy Spirit wants you to do. 
some of us are, and I got to end, but some of us are, some of us, man, we are, we are playing with sexual immorality. That was a YouTube video that I saw. Th these dudes, um, big, big heavyweight dudes, like bodybuilders, went to this zoo or this animal exhibition or, or exhibit, and they have a rope that, that they put on the other side of this, the glass kind of partition, put it in through a hole, and what they said is kind of like, you know, we, we're going to make this into a contest, see who's stronger. There's a lion on that end. Then there's you on the other end. And they, they're grabbing the rope, and you see these guys, you know, get in their stands and wrap this rope around, and, and that lion grabs that rope. That dude went almost flying into the glass. He, he didn't have to do that much. That lion drugged that man without any real effort at all. And he thought that he was strong enough to defeat that lion. And he was foolish enough to try to get into a tug of war yeah. with a beast that was stronger than him. And I'm, I'm here to tell somebody, listen, listen, in and of yourself, sexual immorality is a lion. It is a beast. And you may think you can handle this thing. And you may think you can flirt with this thing. And you may think in and of yourself, you have the strength. But the sexual immorality, lion of sexual immorality will pull you from off of your feet and will have you drugged and, and skinned up because you are not strong in and of yourself to defeat it. This is why Jesus has died on the cross for you, but this is why he also has instructed us through the word on how to deal with that beast. Jesus says, don't pick up the rope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got it, Lord. I got it, Jesus. Don't worry. Jesus said, put the rope down. I I'm all right, Lord. I'm only going to do it once, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. You know how I feel, Lord. Jesus says, put the rope down. I'm good, Lord. I, I got it. Yeah. You see, I got a good grip on this thing. This thing, man, this, <laughs> I'm the champ. Yeah. I got this thing. Yeah. And Jesus is like, son, daughter, I freed you from that. You don't have the strength of yourself. I'm giving you the strength through my word to tell you how you need to handle it. Put the rope down. Yeah. Put the relationship down, single. Mm. You know you don't need to be in it. He doesn't, she does not, she does not honor, she is not trying to fight with you. She, he is not trying to fight sin with you. You need to leave that relationship. For you married folk, you, certain people, you, you, need to, you, you need to stop inboxing. You need to unfriend on Facebook. You need to detach yourself from that old fling. Well, that's my old, that's my ex-girlfriend. We ain't got, ain't nothing, ain't nothing there. It, it may not be right now, but you know she got a, you know she still feel for you. You know he still feel for you. It's, it's dangerous. For you, because you let some argument come happen between you and your wife or your husband, and you, you I'm telling you, next thing you know, she, she, uh, she hitting you up. Yeah. Next thing you know, you mad, so you're going to try to have conversation with her or with him, and then, and then you, you, know, you really get into the hole with your, in your marriage, and then all of a sudden, they're like, why don't we just meet up for coffee? Why don't we just... You know, you can talk to me. You, I, you know, I'm here for you. You know, I really felt she wasn't really that, the one for you anyway. He wasn't the one for you anyway. Single, put the rope down. Flee from sexual immorality. And the bigger thing is, why? Because this is how you honor God. If you want to honor God with your body in relationship to this, flee from it. Yeah. That brings honor to God. That brings honor to your Savior. That says to your Savior, thank you for the price you paid for my sin. And the way that I'm going to show you gratitude is that I am going to put the road down. I'm going to flee from sexual immorality. Because after all... The, the, ple the, ple the, the pleasure and the fullness and the satisfaction that I get from you can't be compared to, yeah. the, to the temporal satisfaction that I get when I commit sexual sin. Yeah. 
But to have your joy yes. and to have your peace, somebody ought to say, hey, somebody know what I'm talking about. To, to have God's, God's peace, to know that you um, don't have to deal with, with guilt on a constant basis and you don't have to deal with conviction on a constant basis. Nothing is better than that. Nothing is better than pleasing Jesus. Nothing is better than glorifying him. Nothing is better than honoring him in your sexuality. Let me close this. So the call, the call today, if you are a believer, we want to lovingly come beside you through this word and tell you if you are, if you are committing sexual immoral acts, Please, brother, please, sister, repent. Fight against it by the grace of God and dependence on the Holy Spirit in prayer. Get some accountability in the body of Christ. Don't try to fight this thing alone. And for those of y'all that are, that are you're walking in sexual purity, the encouragement to you is keep running. Keep running away from sexual immorality. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Lord, we pray that there's someone here, Father, who doesn't know you, that you would, um, you would turn the light on in their hearts. You would bring them to understand and to see your love for them in Jesus and their, their need for Jesus and their sinfulness so that they can run to Jesus and be saved from their sin and from your just wrath against them. That they would do like we did one day, by your grace, that we turn from our sin and trust it in Jesus. Will you help them in that, Father, you told us in, your, in a couple of verses before that no sexual immoral person, no, no person who's a thief, no no gossiper, no liar is going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. That is to say that nobody who is, whose sin has not been dealt with through the cross of Jesus will enter into your kingdom. It doesn't mean we have to get ourselves right. It means that we have to come to Jesus and believe in Jesus, who is the propitiation. He is the satisfaction of our sins, of your wrath against our sins. He has taken our sins upon himself and died for them on the cross. And that that is the way that they are qualified to be in a right relationship with you, have eternal life with you. And so, Father, we pray that you would help them to do that, Lord, to trust in you, Jesus, today for the forgiveness of their sins. We pray for the believer who's listening, who's been listening to this message, who may be struggling with sexual immorality. Father, will you help them Help us to continue to repent and to strive against this sin in our lives by depending on you and seeing the freedom that we have in Jesus from this sin and letting go of the rope of sexual immorality and running away from it. Father, we pray that you will touch the heart of the individual who might be listening online or in the building who needs to connect with the local church. Lord, you brought them here online or in person not on accident, but by providence. And Lord, this may be the church that you desire for them to be a part of. So you put it on their hearts to make that decision known that they can begin to take steps to become connected to our local church family. And if there's a believer who needs to be baptized, who needs to publicly identify with you through water baptism, will you help them to make that decision as well? Lord, as we prepare to give, will you bless our giving? Help us to give to you our first and our best to our local church in your honor, for your glory. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen.